Welcome to the Future of Resolution, Miles Mediation and Arbitration's podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Marcy Dixon. We're going to jump right in and continue a conversation with Brian Buck Rogers and Joe Murphy. Let's turn now and talk a little bit about dispute resolution. You've uh, you've certainly made your reputation far and wide in the courtroom, and uh, but you're someone who also recognizes that in the modern setting where ADR is more important, you've got to be just as effective in the conference room as the courtroom in terms of advocating on behalf of your client. And uh, there's a lot that's said about best practices in mediation, you know, prepare your client, keep an open mind, make a solid presentation, treat it seriously. Um, take me a level higher than that. Well, what pro tip would you give to uh, lawyers on either side coming into mediation um, beyond the obvious stuff? Well, so I would say um, a couple of important things to be aware of. And, and you and I have done this long enough that we have seen trends come and go. And, you know, what is happening now is different than what was happening three years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and, and it's constantly evolving. So you kind of need to be aware of it. And it has something to do with the economy sometimes or, or other dynamics. It could be uh, post SB3 and 05, that was a big game changer. And it changed how people came in here the next day. Um, but um, Explain for our audience what uh, you... Well, the, the, the tort reform, Senate Bill 3 in 2005, where, you know, there was a, a shift in the legislature and it was, you know, now a conservative controlled, you know, General Assembly. And we had probably some pent up frustrations from the insurance industry and the medical community. And um, it was vented well in Senate Bill 3. Um, and so it was a, a big shift in dynamics for the tort world. I mean, a lot of things like offer of judgment and other tort reform measures that were um, implemented that changed how we do what we do. Um, but I think that a, a couple of things that I would um, tell people that that if it's, it, it may be obvious, but people that don't do it um, need to know it. And that is one, letting the other side know the strengths of your case well in advance. Um, for years and years, probably 24 of them up to just recently, I've thought I'm going to have an aha moment at mediation and it's going to change everything. And if I'm successful in having that aha moment, that moment is too late for the adjuster who's there to do something about it. And they're probably saying in the caucus room, I wish I'd known that a month ago and I could have maybe been here with the appropriate authority to deal with it. The second thing is, um, presuming that the insurance company wants to resolve the case. And I did some consulting work recently for an excess carrier that was suing uh, the first several layers of coverage for what we would consider, you know, bad faith, um, failure to protect the lines above. But this was based in England, and their law is sort of opposite ours. There is not a duty up like we think of. Um, but in that, in that business or in that consulting work, I got some insights into how not only the company I was working for conducted their business, but the company that they were suing conducted their business. And it included the reports from defense counsel to the adjusters or the adjusters to higher ups uh, or the adjusters among themselves and emails and, and everything you could imagine. And one of the things I realized was um, that there are situations where the insurance company's intent is to not resolve the case at mediation because by digging in, um, the plaintiff is forced to either accept less than what they want to accept or continue on towards trial. And I, I commented to the company I was working for, and I said, you know, that seems you know, horrible for business. And they said, well, it's horrible for mediation success, but it's excellent for business. Because a lot of plaintiff's lawyers 
are looking at mediation as the opportunity to get it resolved. And that's just optimism and we hope for it. But um, the clients themselves have this idea that maybe this will all be over on such and such a day. And because of that expectation and because of their disappointment at the end of the day, they might compromise down to what the insurance company has dug in at. Um, so the point of all of that is much like as a plaintiff, you need to let the adjuster know in advance the strengths of your case. Um, you also need to know who the adjuster is, what levels of insurance does he or she represent, um, just so you can have an idea if the appropriate authority is even going to be at the mediation. Because if it's not, you need to fix that problem. And and it goes on both sides. If I'm not sharing with the defendant why I think my case is strong with enough time for them to do what needs to be done with it, and I'm counting on this aha moment, I shouldn't be surprised that the adjuster that showed up isn't prepared to pay what I'm asking for. So I would say avoid this idea that it's going to be some dramatic revelation at mediation that's going to make the case happen. Um, doing your homework ahead of time, letting the other side know, you know, and, it, and it's not just strengths. I mean, admitting your weaknesses, you know, because if they come in thinking they're going to reveal something to you and, and surprise you into submission, you need to let them know, I know about that bad fact and I'll deal with it. What are you looking for in a mediator? You know, um, somebody who can communicate both to me and to my client, but to be mindful of not crossing that line. And um, it's a lot easier to tell you what I'm not looking for in a mediator. Um, and you can just figure out what's left. But it's more than just that. So when a mediator starts talking directly to my client and cutting me out of the discussion, then that's when I take those conversations out in the hallway and just, you know, intercept the mediator before he comes back in my caucus room. And then I have the opportunity to filter what is shared in my room or not. But a, a good mediator doesn't undermine the lawyer and doesn't criticize the lawyer's efforts in front of the client. They can be critical of the case. Um, and what I do like is where um, they help manage the expectations of the client. And in those instances, it helps when the mediator asks the lawyer, what can I do to help you with your client? And sharing the, the breadth and depth of experience is important. You know, I've I've handled five trials this year, and that's four more than I really wanted to. But you've done several hundred mediations this year. So you've gotten to see for six to eight hours at a time, 10 to 20 times what I see in a year. So that's an opportunity to share with the client all that you've seen and done in just the past year. Not, not pointing out to the client that I don't have that exposure to all of these different matters, but you do have a lot more exposure than somebody that's just trying cases and not mediating. Another thing I, I definitely like to avoid with mediations is, um, or mediators, is people who um, factor in what they think the case was worth back when they were in private practice. And there's a few of people, and these are more ego-driven folks, but people who say, well, you know, back when I was doing what you do, I would have gotten this on this case, and then we're going to discount it 20% because I have a high opinion of myself, and I'm going to say that you can't accomplish that same level. And by the way, that was 10 years ago, and the dollar has changed in 10 years. I experienced those mediators once, and I'm not a repeat customer. Buck, I've asked you to tell us a little bit about your past and your present. I'm going to ask you to predict the future now. So get out your crystal ball. You mentioned earlier, we've seen so many things in this profession evolve. Just an example in the, in the personal injury category might be things like accident avoidance. There's talk of self-driving cars. As technology and artificial intelligence and other things start to supplant conventional ways that people drive their cars and operate machinery and do things, how do you, as someone who's running a law firm, obviously wanting to plan for the future, how do you see the future of subjects of litigation and how litigation is done with things trending where they are? That's a, a good question. I will tell you, um, in trying to predict the future, I look 
to the past. And 22 years ago, when I was considering the transition from defense work to plaintiff's work, I talked to um, a successful plaintiff's attorney uh, here in Atlanta about my wanting to do that. And she recommended that I pursue intellectual property litigation and not personal injury. So that was IP instead of PI. And so my dyslexia kicked in and I went PI instead. But her point was that 22 years ago, she was predicting that this career or this industry would dry up. And obviously that's not happened in the last 22 years. Is it going to happen in the next 22 years? I don't know. Uh, Frankly, I hope so. I'll find something else to do. But if preventable harm can in fact be prevented, then we'll find something else to do. And um, I don't mean to be glib about it, but for example, MAD, Georgia and MAD National, you know, takes the position that that drunk driving accidents are 100%, 100% preventable. You can either not drink or not drive. You can drink, but don't drive, or you can drive and not drink. So it is preventable. Um, and it is being prevented, not just by MAD's efforts, but also, you know, Uber, Lyft, Rideshare. I mean, these are great resources. And there is a, a noticeable downtick in those types of accidents and claims because of those industries um, becoming more prevalent. So that's great. Um, you know, Accident Avoidance, Road Safe America has been promoting um, automatic braking for, you know, forward-looking. I know your firm was involved in the, um, the horrific Savannah truck accident. I'm, right. I'm thinking, would a self-braking truck have prevented that accident? Absolutely. It absolutely would have, or or at least minimized the severity of it. Instead of having five fatalities, it, it might have been, you know, a swerve off at the last minute. I mean, you have to think about it. An inattentive truck driver, when their power unit starts to automatically brake, is going to become an attentive truck driver. You know, that will be an alert to them. And they might actually be able to do more like a steering correction too. But my point is that, you know, if if technology can prevent a lot of this harm, that's really good. Uh, unfortunately, I think in the short term, we're going to see a reliance on technology that is not reliable. And I've heard of several pretty bad situations where on a test ride of an automatic braking car, the salesperson is trying to demonstrate it and it doesn't work. And injures both the person who's considering buying this safe vehicle and the person that they run into. Uh, We've seen these automatic driven vehicles that are not recognizing cyclists or pedestrians. And these are things that will be fixed eventually. Um, But in the short term, you're going to see some new problems that we didn't have 10 years ago. And you're going to see a lot of the same problems that we've had for years and years. I think specifically with the trucking industry, there's a lot of pushback with regard to some safety protocol. Uh, Owner operators, OIDA, are really fighting it because this is a cost that you know, fleet companies can bear, but a smaller owner operator may not be able to absorb that cost as easily. And you've got a current administration that is trying to eliminate regulation of of private industry, not regulate it more. So, you know, for the trucking industry, um, unfortunately, I don't see it getting much safer in the next two years. Um, Now, when we have more automated shipping, then it may get safer, and that'll be great. But I don't think that's happening anytime real soon. Where I see the future headed... This is where an Amazon drone is going to fly to my house and drop the package at my doors. It could be, but you're going to have problems with Amazon drones now. I mean, it's going to interfere with air traffic, or or uh, a motorist will be distracted by it while they pull into your neighborhood and, you know, hit your neighbor's mailbox. Um So there'll be other problems that come from the solutions. And, you know, lawyers doing what we do is trying to solve those problems or trying to prevent the problems or trying to get adequate compensation once the problem has occurred is more likely result. Where I see the future heading, if if there is a downtick in what we consider normal personal injury tort type work, I think what we'll see happening for the people that handle those cases is what is happening now to what I would consider some exceptional plaintiff's practices. That is the evolution out of just straight up tort work into complex commercial litigation. And you see it with, you know, um, Butler Wooten has been doing it for 20 years. Um, Darren Penn has several, you know, accomplished cases that are commercial complex cases. And what the skill set that those kind of practices bring is, you know, the ability to try a case. 
but the ability to work up the case, but also the willingness to take it on a contingency fee, which is something that just doesn't seem to be out there in the complex commercial world. So while I don't think tort cases are going to disappear in the next 22 years, if they do, great. You've prevented preventable harm, and that's sort of the purpose. And if they do, these good tort lawyers will probably become good, complex commercial litigation lawyers willing to do those cases on a contingency, which I think will, you know, there is a niche for that now, and it's underserved. Well, we talked about mentors earlier, and uh, my mentor was Harry Bassler. He taught me how to practice law and drink scotch, <laughs> and I think I learned both from him. But the uh, last question he always taught me to ask at a deposition, I'm going to borrow that and ask you this question. After you've covered everything you think you should have, the last question was always, is there anything that's important to you that's on your mind I've neglected to ask you about that you'd like to share with us? You know, I, I think that um, what I would suggest for, for lawyers is just to strive for um, a sense of self-awareness and focus on not just who you want to be, but who you are. Because if you know who you are, it's easier to get where you want to be. And sometimes that makes you think about, well, what is it I want to be? And um, if it's financial success, then be honest about it. You're really after one thing. If it is true happiness, then that gets back to your point about the balance. And um, I think the self-awareness is a, is a big part of that. And we have a tendency to um, spend so much time, me trying to convince you who I am, that I'm not spending much time thinking about who I am. Uh, I'm, I'm more focused on my outward presentation than I am about an inward awareness. And, you know, a lot of that comes from the bar work I've done and seeing people. And like you mentioned earlier, it's always a surprise. And the reason it's a surprise is I've done such a good job of convincing you who I want you to perceive me to be. And I've done such a poor job knowing myself who I want to be. And so I can't know who you are and you can't know who I am, but we can each know who we are. And, and I just think you have to take a minute and reflect on it. It doesn't have to be every day, but just kind of check yourself now and again. And the other thing is, you know, with regard to suicide prevention and those kind of concerns, you know, we, we build up these walls and we're not open to being critical of ourselves or each other. And compassion, you know, means you kind of pull somebody aside. And, and I've had people kind of do a check, you know, in the trial I tried up in Fannin County, I tested positive for strep the Friday before the Monday start. And that Monday start, I felt like I could hear myself, like I had my head was echoing. That's what it sounded like inside my head. And uh, my co-counsel, Darren Somerville, was handling some pretrial matters. And he kind of grabbed me and said, hey, are you okay? I was like, you know, I, I, I'm not really 100% this morning. And he, he just was like, all right, that's an example of a sickness, an illness that can be treated with antibiotics. But there are other sicknesses and illnesses that we're aware of. And pulling somebody aside and saying, are you okay? Not being critical of them, are you okay? But hey, fuck, you're a little out of sorts today. Everything all right? Um, I know you're upset about the mediation, or I know you're upset about, you know, that trial or, or you know, whatever it is. Are you okay? It's a private conversation. And I may say I'm fine even if I'm not fine. But my takeaway is Joe cares. And that may be all I need to hear. Well, Buck Rogers, you are a busy, busy man. And I appreciate you fitting us into your work-life balance to share some time with us today. Your thoughts and insights are very, very helpful. The uh, 12 signs and uh, the access that lawyers have to help with the bar without fear that that would somehow alert the bar in negative ways. I think if that's one takeaway that anyone got from this, that was plenty enough. But I want to thank you for so much, again, in terms of your time and your thoughts. You're welcome. Happy to do it. For more information about the programs referenced in this episode, please check out the State Bar of Georgia's website, gabar.org. The Georgia Lawyers Helping Lawyers is a program provided to colleagues who are suffering from stress, depression, addiction, or other personal issues in their lives. This service is available to any bar member, and you have an opportunity to speak with a fellow bar member who's there to listen and help. You will be speaking with a trained volunteer who has also been trained by Corp Care, which is a service that is contracted with the State Bar of Georgia to help ensure confidentiality. 
The Lawyer Assistance Program is also a confidential service provided by the State Bar to help bar members with life's difficulties. The Lawyer Assistance Program provides a broad range of services designed to help members who are seeking assistance with depression, stress, alcohol, drug abuse, family problems, workplace conflicts, psychological issues, and anything else. You can contact the Lawyer Assistance Program by calling 1-800-327-9631. You can also find more information on the State Bar of Georgia's website. Another helpful resource can be found at the State Bar of Georgia's website at gabar.org slash wellness. Um, it's the Georgia Lawyers Living Wellness page, and it provides a plethora of information for attorneys um, on mental, physical, and social well-being. Um, it provides information um, about programs like the Aging Lawyers and Lawyers in Transition Program, uh, the Lawyer Assistance Program, the Suicide Awareness Campaign, and SOLACE, which is a program designed um, to help uh, attorneys or legal professionals who are experiencing potentially significant life-changing um, events. Um, a word about the suicide awareness campaign. Um, there is information for lawyers and judges who are suffering from anxiety or depression and may be at risk for suicide. Um, it provides information for um, these individuals who may be recognizing signs within themselves, but it also provides warning signs uh, for attorneys and judges and legal personnel who may see these signs in others. Um, and they are extremely um, easy to spot um, when you review the 12 warning signs that are listed on the Georgia Lawyers Living Wellness page. Uh, again, if you are in need of um, speaking to someone, um, you can access the Confidential Lawyer Assistance Program hotline at 1-800-327-9631. You've been listening to The Future of Resolution, the podcast. You can follow The Future of Resolution on Miles Mediation and Arbitration's Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join us soon for another interesting discussion. Thank you for listening.